أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يقولون أئنا لمردودون في الحافرة أئذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله وصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد ونسجن ربي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, Now we are uh, wrapping up the second passage of the surah The first of them was the oaths The second of them was a description of judgment day And how rapidly it comes And it's building on the image that was already painted by the, the, the oaths that were about the raiders that are coming in Now of the statements we read, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ يَقُولُونَ is in the present tense, can also be understood in the future tense, which is why the interpretation exists that this statement is going to be made on Judgment Day, alongside the fact that it could be something that people are saying as skeptics even now. The word rad in Arabic, مَرْدُودُونَ is in the meaning of الرَّجْعُ وَالْعَوْدُ وَالْإِرْتِدَادَ الرُّجُوعُ فِي الطَّرِيقَ الَّذِي جِئَ مِنْهُ Rad actually means to go back where you came from. To go, to, to go back to the starting point. Rad also has the meaning of rejection. Meaning that we are, when you say, inna la mardu duna fil hafira, human beings are actually accepting the fact that they're originally dirt. And they're going back into dirt. You know? And so their skeptical claim is when we're going to be thrown into the hafira, which is to me the more, the even more interesting a word, uh, why Allah used the word hafira here and what, what it means. Hafara in Arabic is to throw dirt up. Or to dig dirt. Like, man hafara hufratan waqa'a fiha. The students know the expression, right? The, whoever digs a ditch, you know, he's the one who's gonna fall in it. You know, uh, so the, the idea that Quran even says, la yahiqul makru sayyi'u illa bi ahlihi. That's the way the, the Arabs have that saying, man hafara hufratan waqa'a fiha. But in any way, in the Arabic language, uh, summiya hafirul fars li hafrihi fi adwihi. They, they say in Arabic, the, the horse, its hoof is also called a hafir or a hafira because it, it digs into the ground, you know, and it leaves a footprint, an imprint into the ground. Wasamul qabr hafiran. They used to, one of the words for the Arab, for the, for the grave in Arabic is hafir from the same origin. Walladhi yahfir al qubur hafar. And the one who, who digs the graves, he's called a hafar from the same origin. As a matter of fact, uh, it's really interesting that from it came an expression in Arabic, an naqdu عند الحافرة. It's an old saying, which means the most expensive thing that they used to sell back in the day is a high branded horse, which is still a pretty big deal. Nowadays, horses sell for five, six million dollars, like some of them. It's crazy, right? So they, the most and Arabian horses are, are known around the world, right? So they used to sell very, very expensive horses, but they never sold them on credit. In other words, you can take my horse now and pay me in a month, na'a. So they would say, al-naqdu عند الحافرة, meaning, which literally would mean something else, but basically what it means is, until I see the cash, that horse is not taking a dash, is what, what that means. But what, what that means in the expression is, hafira is it's standing in the stable, and it's just standing there in one place, you know, plowing its foot. And until I see cash, it ain't moving from there. It's going to keep on digging where it is. Okay? So, al-naqdu عند الحافرة. So from it, there's a meaning that got developed in the usage of the Arabic language. ثُمَّ نُقِلَ إِسْتِعْمَالُهُ إِلَّا كُلِّ حَالَةٍ أُولَى Then its usage became anything that it's in its original state. is hafira. So it has two implications. One, of a whole. وَالْأَوْلَى أَنْ يَسْتَبْقَ اللَّفْضِ دَلَالَتُهُ اللُّغَوِيَّ عَلَى حُفْرَةِ الْقَبْرِ وَعَلَى الْحَالَةِ الْأُولَى It means two things. The, the ditch of a grave, like from hafir, and the original state. And now understand the statement, inna fil hafira. Are we really going to be thrown back after, you know, are we seriously going to be taken back into the ditch, into the original state? Into the original state, al hafira. This is the question that the skeptics of the akhirah are raising, or this is the terrible like, realization, like kalla sayya'lamun, that they're arriving at when they, when they see judgment day ha uh, happen. Nakhira, I told you, is decayed bones. I wanted to read some of the Arabic meanings of, for you too. Uh, an-nakhir bi ma'na al-bala, or bali. 
لكن نخرة أبلغ من نخرة. We say كنا عظاما نخرة when we've decayed into when we when we've turned into decayed bones actually means hollow on the inside. The the word نخير الصوت ينبعث من شيء أجوف of a sound that comes out of a hollow item. So hollowed up, hollowed in bones, decayed bones. And that's why actually the nose is also called minkhar. One of the Arabic words for the nose is minkhar because the nose is hollow on the inside. Okay? Anyway, I wanted to highlight that because they're suggesting that we are going to be completely decayed and hollow on the inside. This is interesting because we aren't entirely hollow. We're not just made up of bones. There's a ruh Allah put inside and they don't see that. They just see the physical body, which is something I talked to you about yesterday. And so they're saying when that's gone, what is left of us? There's no reason to think that there's going to be an akhirah. أَيْ لَا كُنَّا عِظَامَ النَّخِرَةِ قَالُوا تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ they said, this is then going to be a very, it's a losing return. Literal translation, that is, in that case, that's going to be a losing return. The word qalu, as Bintu Shatih correctly points out, is an extra verb. You already have yaquluna. Yaquluna a'inna lamarduduna fil hafirati a'idha kunna idhaman nakhira tilka idhan karratun khasira. وَكُلُّهُ مَقُولَ الْقَوْلِ مِنْ مِنْ فِعِلْ يَقُولُونَ So all of it goes back to they say, that's already been mentioned, but in this ayah, in the twelfth ayah, Allah said again, قَالُوا They said, تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ And قَالُوا is in the past tense. And so it is as though on judgment day, they are saying, we were decayed bones, we weren't going to come back. And Allah says, remember when they used to say past tense? That when that, come on, that's going to happen? Yeah, it'd be pretty bad if that happened. Like Allah is taking a, let me just again be silly with you. You know, in movies sometimes they take you into a scene from back in the day, like trip down memory lane, and the screen becomes wavy and then it becomes black and white because that was in the past, right? This is a transition in film to take you back in time, right? And that's actually something that in the, in the depiction and the narration of the Qur'an happens regularly. Like you're talking about something in the future, and all of a sudden you're going back. And these same people that are crying before Allah on Judgment Day, how did our broken bones and decayed bones come back together, are now being taken back and shown a scene where they were standing there saying, seriously, we're going to be raised again? Oh, that's going to be really bad. I'm, I'm terrified. Tilka idan karratun khasira, man. That's going to be a really bad, a really loss-filled return. They were making this statement sarcastically, and Allah is making them, in a sense, eat those words now. That's what's happening in this powerful speech. So you, you, you see, therefore, there's even sarcasm in the Qur'an. There's even Allah letting people know, this is how they will feel, this is how they will regret the same words that they say. Words have weight before them. And it's not just words have weight. By the way, the statement, Tilka idan karratun khasira is true. If in fact there is resurrection, if in fact there is judgment, if in fact there is hell for those who disbelieved, that is a very losing proposition. That second time around you're brought to life, which is what karra means, a second time around, you know, a second chance. When you're raised again, you're, it's a pretty bad losing chance. You're going to be in serious trouble at that time. So the statement in and of itself is true. But a lot of times you say true statements sarcastically. Oh my God, that's so terrible. You know, I sounded like Trump for a second, but anyway. <laughs> it's terrible, terrible. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. And then Allah says, no, Allah doesn't have to, resp it's, it's, you know, look at the ayah on its own, and we'll, we'll look at what it means, but I want you to dig a little deeper too with me. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. Zajr in Arabic is used for when animals are yelled at. So zajr al-kalb, fissawki or fissuq, when, uh, when uh, horses, dogs, animals misbehave, and the master says, ah! And the dog goes, ah! You know, that's what it does. That's called zajr. That scolding of an animal is called zajr. And from it you get, when you humiliate people, and you scold them, and you talk to them like animals, and you put them in their place, that's a person who is muzdajar. And that's actually when the messengers of Allah, people would say about them, وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ muzdajir. You know, this, this person's insane. He deserves to be yelled at. Like an animal is hushed away. 
How, like an animal is silenced, you know? And so Allah uses that word, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ It is only going to be one single scolding. Allah does not have to, you know, argue with these people and their obnoxious claims. Allah doesn't have to respond to every criticism they make, every joke they make. No, Allah just needs one scolding, and that's enough. And the ta is for lil marra, right? So the ta at zajratun, the ta that you hear, is for a one-time thing, something that happens once. Like for example, in Arabic, when you say akl, it means eating, but aklatun is a single meal, one single meal, right? Marra or marrun is to pass by. Marratun is a single passing by, right? So when you add a tamar buta, this is for it's called bastar marra, something that happens only one time, okay? Sim, same, similarly like tamratun or other words, when you add tamar buta, it becomes one thing, right? He says zajratun, and so it's already one, but he says zajratun wahidatun. If he says zajratun, it's already wahida. It's already one. But he added, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida, As if to say, this is the kind of single scolding that shall never have to be repeated again. What he's referring to is the raising of them, إِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ نَفْخَةٌ wahida. That, that scolding through the horn, that scolding will be enough. Everybody will be silenced after that. There's not going to be any attitude left. There's not going to be any defiance left in humanity. And so he says, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. It'll just be one call of resurrection. One scolding, a single scolding. And then, فَإِذَا Then all of a sudden, هُمْ sahira. All of a sudden they find themselves in the sahira. Sahira means a night in which they can't sleep. Laylatun sahira. فَإِذَا هُمْ بِلَيْلَةٍ سَاهِرَةٍ The word sahir is an adjective in the Arabic for the word layl. Like مَنْ سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ Right? مَنْ بَلَغَ الْعُلَى سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ وَطَلَبَ الْعُلَى سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ Whoever wants to reach great heights spends nights sleepless. Sahira means the night that doesn't let you sleep. Like what you call a sleepless night? That's sahira. Well, what in the world does that suggest? It means that judgment day and the resurrection is not bright, it's dark. That we're in the darkness. That's why we're gonna need light on judgment day. That's the first thing it means. Also, night is associated with sleep, but this is a night in which there is no sleep whatsoever. Why isn't there any sleep? You know, there were so many interpretations of sahira. Bint Shatih mentions them. I won't give you the list. It's a long list of things that were, Sahira, Sahira could be in Jahannam, Sahira is the field where they will stand, Sahira is all these things. She says, go back to the language. It's not used like this anywhere else. It's used in the Qur'an in this particular way, go to the word that the Arabs used to think about when they heard the word Sahira. Not what you think after Islam, what the people thought before Islam when they first heard it. And she argues, Sahira is a night when you're terrified and you can't sleep. By the way, the, the painting that was painted in the surah, you'll notice each one of these surahs is very picturesque, right? The painting was people were sleeping, and then they got raided, wasn't it? And when you get raided, what can't happen anymore? You can't sleep. We're like, oh, is there another wave? Is there another wave coming? Is there another radifa on the way? And so they're going to be standing there, just like the people who've been raided, in shock, and they're going to be in a sleepless night. They're going to find themselves in a sahira. It's actually playing off of the image that's already been painted of the people that were raided. Because on judgment day, the criminal shall be raided. And they will be, they will be anticipating, where's the attack coming from? I can't sleep tonight. You know, when they know that the, that the judgment is coming or the enemy is coming after them and they know it's coming but they don't know which direction it's coming from. And it's a nervous night of standing guard and you know, you, you're just in shock the entire time. This is فَإِذَاهُمْ sahira. And from here, where we go is, is one of the most beautiful transitions in the Qur'an. Qur'an does not go from one subject to another without an agenda, without a purpose. I've tried to illustrate that to you multiple times. So far, it was about the shock of Judgment Day compared with the shock of being raided by, a, you know, by looters. All of a sudden from there, we end up in a place that you didn't expect at all. Part of the signature style of the Qur'an. What is it? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Did the news of Musa ever reach you? إِذْ نَادَهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى When his master called him in the sacred valley, طُوَى And طُوَى I'll explain a little later. اِذْهَبِ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى Saying to him, go to the Pharaoh, he has rebelled. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى And go say to him, would you consider for yourself maybe some road to redemption? Maybe you want to better yourself as a person? Maybe you want to grow out of the darkness you're in? 
you know, improve yourself and become purified. وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى Maybe on perhaps I can guide you to, towards your master. Maybe you'll become fearful of God too. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى Thereafter, after giving him that message, he showed him the ultimate sign. الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى So he called it all a lie. Hey baby, stop it. It's bothering me. Yeah, that one. Yeah, the cute one. Okay. فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى I mentioned the staff and somebody started, you know, <laughs> but it's not the other, it's the other Asa. <laughs> so he called it all a lie and he disobeyed, meaning he disobeyed Musa alayhi salam. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Then he turned his back and made all kinds of efforts. فَحَشَرَ فَنَادَى Then he gathered, meaning he gathered his entire society, legions of people in front of him, stood on the balcony of his castle, and declared, فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى uh, Then he said, I am your most supreme master. I am your sup- most supreme God. أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى Then Allah made him into a warning, into a, a lesson that people will take heed from for those who will come at the end of times and even the earliest generations. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى No doubt about it, in all of that, there's a powerful moving lesson for anybody who has fear. This passage was the story of Musa in, summer, in summary, isn't it? What is it doing here in the description of Judgment Day? Let me help you first understand this connection, then we'll go ayah by ayah. So like I told you my, my, my method, I gave you a brief translation to tell you what the passage is about. Now we try to understand how it's connected, and then we go into it ayah by ayah. So that's the step-by-step process. So the thing here is that the, the Day of Judgment is when Allah will send His angels. And the angels will stand as armies to deliver the punishment against the people. The earth will rebel against the criminals. It will have Rajifa, and there will be another wave. All of that horrible stuff is going to happen, you can't avoid it. Except, before Allah sends armies of angels to punish humanity and judge them, Allah sends them messengers lovingly, mercifully, kindly, to give them that message softly, so they don't land themselves in trouble on Judgment Day. Let me just give you an appreciation of what's being said. A lot, you guys don't watch movies, so I always have to refer to things that, you know, because you're religious people, you live in Frisco. So, so, so here's the thing. You've got this movie. I'm not going to tell you which one because I made it up. There's a movie, and there's this army that is about to attack a village. And one guy from the village comes out, just unarmed, stands in front of this army and says, if you know what's good for you, you'll turn around, repent, and from now on you'll give charity to those people you are about to raid and kill. And um, I'm, giving, I'm just here to warn you, I, it's not me, I'm just here to warn you. I'm just letting you know, if you know what's good for you, otherwise you will be destroyed, and not one of you will survive. What is the response of that massive army standing in front of that one man? Oh yeah? will be destroyed by who? You and what army? Isn't it? You and what army? What is a messenger of Allah? He comes and tells a powerful people like Quraysh, he comes and tells a, a great king, maybe the greatest ever, Fir'aun, you better change your behavior if you know what's good for you, because you're about to be annihilated. And they're like, you're going to warn me? Look at the language. A king is obeyed. A king is obeyed. And a king does not, you don't say about a king, a king disobeyed. You don't say that. What does Allah say about Fir'aun? فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى He called it a lie and he disobeyed. If you're, calling, if you're saying Fir'aun disobeyed, it's like you're saying he's not a king, there's a king above him who he disobeyed. That's the language that's being used. Messengers come without armies. Messengers come without force. They just come with a message. But their armies are legions upon legions upon legions of angels. Who you better take heed from? Their armies are in the unseen. Who you better take heed from? There used to be two levels of warnings. Now there's only one left. Two levels used to be, in the messenger's own lifetime, these people will be destroyed. Now that, that destruction is gone. But the other one is still there. Judgment day is coming, and those legions of angels are still waiting for you. They're still going to come and judge you. 
take that warning seriously. Just because you don't see an army standing behind him, no force behind him to implement the authority, doesn't mean that it doesn't command respect. You know, human beings understand authority. We, and if we didn't, society wouldn't exist. I mean, I, I really appreciated what authority means when I, went to, when I traveled to Singapore. Because in Singapore, when you land on the plane, it says, if you are caught with ill, so they say this in very nice language, you know the flight attendants say you can take your seat belts off now and get your bags and you can start pushing each other, etc. When she says that, so she says, and if you're found with illicit drugs, you will be given the death penalty immediately. Enjoy your stay in Singapore. <laughs> I took my mosquito spray and put it in my friend's bag. Because, <laughs> you know, we're not friends anymore. Uh, so, but I go there and it's illegal to chew gum. It's not illegal to spit out a piece of gum. It's illegal to chew gum, which means most of you teenagers would die there. Right? Because you're like, what? You know? <laughs> but people respect it. Universally, they respect it. Nobody chews gum. You know? And they have to, no, no, it's a gummy bear. It's a gummy bear. <laughs> you know? <laughs> People understand authority, whether it makes sense to them or not. They understand it. But when it comes to the authority of the unseen, there's a lot of wiggle room. There's a, I mean, I'm not getting arrested for this yet. So it's okay. Now with that in mind, that great raid is coming. And Allah will not send that great army yet to attack these people and put them in their place yet. All he will send is a messenger. And Allah has sent you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And you, Muhammad, should remember, your job is no different than the job given to Musa. And if these people think they're powerful, and they're mighty, and nobody can question them, they are nothing compared to who? Fir'aun. Who are they? What great kingdom do they command? They have mud homes in the middle of a desert. They are surrounded by empires who don't even know they exist. Their greatest assets are horses and camels. This, they, they, don't have, they don't even have oil yet. This is who they are. They should know that I sent messengers to much more powerful than, that, than them. Much more powerful than them. Man ashaddu minhum batshan. People that were much more capable of punishing messengers and grabbing messengers, and arresting messengers, and executing them, than the Quraysh are. Quraysh at least have to have a town hall meeting. After all, Muhammad, they don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after all, he is from Quraysh, we should take it easy, maybe we should give him a warning, maybe we should just beat him up and let him go. They have to consider. Fir'aun's time, he could just give the order, it's done. Ashaddu minhum batshan. Who's gonna ask them? Who's gonna question Fir'aun? And Allah says, take lessons from the story of Musa. Understand particularly about Musa alayhi salam whenever he comes up. This is one of the last times he's coming up because we're at the end of Quran now, right? But understand something about Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is the closest messenger to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam in the Quran. That is why Allah mentions him more than any other messenger in the Quran. In the Quran, Allah does not talk to our messenger or talk about our messenger by name because he only mentioned him by name four times. And he talks about Musa alayhi salam 70 times. Why? Because the life of Musa alayhi salam many times is actually a superimposing over the life of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Don't forget that. When you're studying the life of Musa alayhi salam, you're actually also at the same time studying the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam all the time. Every time you studied in the Quran, that's the case. How so? Musa alayhi salam's career is two basic groups. He spoke to the pharaohs, he led the Israelites. It's two basic parts. And in between them, there's a hijrah. In between them, there's a migration. The messenger's life. He's talking to the Quraysh, which are like the pharaoh. And he's dealing with the Jews and the hypocrites of Medina, which is like the Israelites. And in between them, there's a migration, there's a hijrah. It's actually superimposed. All the challenges Musa had with the Israelites, our messenger had with the munafiqun. All the challenges Musa had with Fir'aun, our messenger had with Quraysh. They're superimposed. So you have this peril, and the Sahaba understood this. So when the first time the Prophet told them to fight in the path of Allah, they said, we're not gonna be like the people who didn't follow Musa. 
We're not going to be like them and say, Inna ha huna qa'idun. We're sitting here waiting, you go fight. We're not going to be like them. They understood who they are in comparison. So the study of Musa alayhi salam is actually not just the study of Musa alayhi salam, it's the study of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam himself. Okay. وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَىٰ And did the news of Musa reach you? Hadith means a new, something new that happens. In other words, think of the story of Musa as it's just being given to you. I want to read to you something I can't help myself because I, I read the passage to you already uh, of, um, of هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَىٰ uh, the, the entire translation. But uh, let me tell you, Allah says here, He called them to the valley of Tuwa. You know that in the valley of Tuwa, when Allah called Musa a long conversation happened, right? And then when he got back from the valley, he had long debates with Fir'aun. And then there was long, a long, many years spent of the struggle between the Egyptians and Musa salam. Then they crossed the water. There were the nine signs. There's all this stuff happened. But none of that is mentioned here right now. It's super brief. It's like a few ayat and the whole story is done. So what does she say? وَلَوْ قَصَدَ الْقُرْآنِ Actually, I'll go further. Uh, uh, actually, this is not... The, this, he, she goes, وَبِحَسَبِ الْقُرْآنِ أَنْ يُلْفِتَ إِلَى مَصِيرِ, مصير الطَّاغِيَ لِيَكُونَ عِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى وَلَمْ يَعْلِ الْقُرْآنِ هُنَا بِشَيْءٍ مِّن تَفْصِيلِ الْقِصَّةِ The Qur'an did not intend to give you any details in the surah. Allah does not want to give you details. وَلَمْ يَذْكُرْ نَشْأَةَ مُوسَى He didn't mention how Musa was raised. وَصِلَتَهُ الْأُولَى بِفِرْعُونَ And his early connection to the Pharaoh. وَلَمْ يُحَدِّدْ تَارِيخَ الْحَادِثَةَ It didn't give you the dates of when this happened. بَلْ لَمْ يَذْكُرْ كَذَلِكَ نَوْعَ الْآيَةِ الْكُبْرَى He didn't even mention, he says he showed him the great sign, the greatest sign. He doesn't even say what the greatest sign was. There's a debate. Was it the hand? Was it the staff? Which one was, was it the water parting? Which one was the greatest sign? Sign, there's a big debate. Allah could have solved the debate and said, the greatest sign, and I mean this one. He could have just ended that debate. He didn't end it. He, he says, كَذَلِكَ نَوْعَ الْآيَةِ الْكُبْرَىٰ الَّتِي أَرَاهَا مُوسَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ وَنَوْعُ النَّكَالَ الَّذِي أَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ بِهِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَىٰ Allah says He made an example out of the Pharaoh for the, for the latest generations and the earlier ones. But what is, how did he make him into an example? He doesn't mention here. وَإِنَّمَا الَّذِي عَنَاهُ أَنْ يُعْرِضَ مِنَ الْقِصَّةِ مَوْضِعَ الْعِبْرَةِ دُونَ تَعَلُّقٍ بِتَفْصِيلِ الْجُزْئِيَاتِ مِمَّا لَيْسَ مِنْ جَوْهَرِ الْمَوْقِفِ She says that all Allah mentioned, all Allah talked about is what is enough for you to take warning. You should be to Muhammad like Fir'aun should have been to Musa. Because if you're not like that to him, you're going to end up like Fir'aun. If I can do that to Fir'aun, who are you, Quraysh? That's all the point that's being made. Now, the reason she mentions that is when we study these ayat, we're like, let's go over the entire story at Wadi al-Muqaddas Tuwa. Then let's go over the entire idhabila Fir'aun in Nahu Tagha. Let's go into all the details of Hallaka ila anta zakka. That's not the point here. That point will be made elsewhere. When you dive too much into those details, you won't, you'll lose the point of what's being said here. Where you are in the Qur'an. So oftentimes what happens is when we're studying Qur'an, we pay all of our attention to all the other places that it might connect to. That is of secondary value. The primary value is where are you right now? What is being talked about right now? Pay attention to that first. Give it its due first. Then see the connections that come from other places in the Qur'an. Anyhow, so Allah tells the Messenger to think about the story of Musa, which he's heard many times already. This is actually a later Makkan Surah by many accounts. If Nadahu Rabbuhu, when his master called him, Bil Wadi al Muqaddas, Allah also called his, his, his messenger, Ali Sato Salam. He also met him in a cave up in a mountain. And Musa Ali Salam also received revelation in a mountain. He went up there. Bil Wadi al Muqaddas, he saw him in the sacred valley. Now, the sacred valley, that, you know, Turi Sinin, Mount Sinai, and all of that, what, why is Allah calling it Tuwa? So some say, Tuwa isman lil Wadi al Muqaddas, it's the name of the sacred valley. Tuwa also means, for example, uh, uh, a sacred place, Tuwa min al-layl means a, a small part of the night. And from it, an entire conversation came out, well, that place was only sacred that one night. So it was only sacred because that fire was lit there that one time and Allah spoke to him. Only that folded part of the night. Why? Because the verb Tawa in Arabic means to fold up. Like Tay. Tayya, it comes from tay, which means to fold up or roll up. So it was only one rolled up portion of the night where that conversation happened, and that is when that sacred nature of the night existed. That's another argument. But what I found the most beautiful 
is, some say, by the way, Tuwa is the name of the valley, right? It's Ismul Alam, Lilwad. But she says, so beautiful, she says, وَأَقْرَبُ مِنْهُ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ And I find the closest to this, and Allah knows best, أَن تَكُونَ حَالًا لِلْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ That it's a hal. A hal in English means it's an adverb, and even that's not understandable to you, I know. You don't know what an adverb is, and that's okay. Eighth grade was a long time ago, and for those of you who are in eighth grade, you get some of the best sleep of your life in English class, so I understand. <laughs> what does that mean? حَيْثُ طُوِيَةِ الْأَبْعَادُ مَا بَيْنَ أَرْضٍ وَسَمَاءِ Allah. She says, when Allah called him to the sacred valley, as it folded up the distance between the skies and the earth, the one in the skies came down to the one on the earth and they spoke together. And so the Tuwa is actually describing how the skies and the earth came so close to each other that one night when Allah spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And how, how did that happen with our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the night when Jibreel alayhi salam gave him Qur'an. Right? So it's describing this closeness between the skies and the earth of that night. So when that happens, what does Allah say to him? اِذْهَبِ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنِ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ Go to the Pharaoh. By the way, Fir'aun in, in, is not an Arabic word. It's obviously an ancient Egyptian word. Its original pronunciation is argued to be Par'a. Par'a is two syllables. And it actually means the house, the great house. Literally from the ancient Egyptian language. Research suggests it means the great house. And the reason he's called that is because he, was a, he, he wasn't just a person, he was symbolized by the castles and monuments that he built. The pharaohs were losing many wars. And when they started winning wars, they wanted to instill fear into their enemies. So what they would do is they would build the most prominent buildings, like the pyramids, like the sphinx and other structures, and call massive columns, especially on roadways where people traveled, or on the banks of rivers. So when people would pass by their kingdom, they would see the most colossal buildings, and they were not just people to them, now they were giant houses to them. The pharaohs are like giant houses to them. And that's actually what helps you understand when his wife, Asiya, wants escape from him, what does she say? رَبِّبْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ Make me a house in Jannah, I don't want this big house. Make me a house in Jannah. It's actually a play on the word Fir'aun that she, وَنَجِنِي مِنْ Fir'aun, which could be literally translated, and rescue me from the big house. <laughs> you know, from the Pharaoh, who is actually the big house, the castle. I don't want the castle, subhanAllah. Anyway, إِذْهَ بِلَا Fir'aun, Go to the, the Pharaoh, go to the man in the castle, إِنَّهُ طَغَى No doubt about it, he's rebelled. He's crossed the line. Tughyan is again crossing the line. Like I was telling you yesterday, إِنَّا لَمَّا طَغَى الْمَاءُ حَمَلْنَاكُمْ فِي الْجَارِيَةِ When water crosses the line, it has no limit. The Pharaoh doesn't care what he does. He doesn't care who he kills. He doesn't care what law he breaks. It's not just that he commits crimes against Allah and declares himself God. He kills people. He oppresses people. He does injustice. He acts like he owns people. He enslaved an entire people. He's committed crimes against humanity. That is his tughyan. Go to him and he, because he has rebelled. Other places in the Quran you will learn, Musa didn't just go to him alayhi salam to tell him about Allah. Musa went to him to say, you need to let the Israelites go. And arsil ma'ana bani Israel. Let the Israelites go. What the Bible says, let my people go, right? That's literally in the Quran. And arsil ma'ana bani Israel. Along with me and Aaron, you better let this, the children of Israel be released. You know, and he wouldn't let them go. In Nahutaha. And by the way, this is similar. To, this is this is important on a side note. This is not about language, but this is about history. But again, these things get overlooked. So I, I make it a point to highlight them to you. Firaun is compared to who in the Prophet Sira? Quraysh. Firaun committed shirk. Quraysh commit shirk. But let's dig a little deeper. Why do they commit shirk? Understand something. The, the shirk of Fir'aun was political in nature. Why does he have slaves as the Israelites? It's free labor. If he doesn't have them, he can't build those massive castles. If he doesn't have those massive castles, he can't impress and instill fear into other kingdoms. And his kingdom will collapse. He has an entire political machinery in place, and in order to keep it in place, he needs to have slaves. The other Egyptians, why don't they rebel against him? Because he's created a religious worldview where the sun is God, Ra, 
and they are descendants of the sun god. So the children of God are gods of the earth, while the sun is the god of the sky. Right? So you can't mess with God. Messing with him is not just a crime against the government. It's a crime against God. It's, it's sacrilegious. So he's created a religion in which messing with him is actually against the religion. So he's using religion to, to ensure his political stability. Think about that carefully. Religion can be used for political purposes, as it always has been. And it still is. Just go to any election, anywhere in the world, and find a politician kissing babies during the election season at a church. Religion is used for political purposes. Now come to Quraysh, more importantly. Quraysh didn't worship one god, they worshiped many gods. Where did they keep the idols? Around the Kaaba. Those idols were not the Quraysh's idols. Those idols belonged to all the other tribes. Quraysh had one or two, all the other tribes, each one of the tribes had their own custom NBA, no, no, custom team, idol, that they used to come and visit. And the idol is only sacred at the Kaaba. You can't take it home with you. You gotta come here and visit and pay your respects. When they come and pay respects, when, you come, when we come to Mecca today, do you spend money and help the economy of Mecca? You have to stay in a hotel, you have to buy food from the restaurants, you're gonna end up shopping, you're gonna pay a visa fee or whatever else fee, you're gonna make, the cabbies are gonna make money off of you, the bus driver, the crazy bus driver is gonna make money off of you, There's, everybody's gonna make money off of you, isn't it? You're gonna be supporting that economy because you are visiting the Kaaba. For them, the reason to, for other people to come and visit the Kaaba is each god is actually their customer base. This one is coming from Jersey, and those guys come from Philadelphia, and those guys come from Texas. They're all coming from different tribes. And if they lose one idol, they lose an entire customer base. When the Quran comes and says, destroy these idols, they say, are you crazy? Nobody's gonna come here anymore. What do we have, like gold here? All we got is water and these stones, these wooden idols. You get rid of them, you get rid of our economy. That means we're no longer the wealthiest tribe. And if we're not the wealthiest tribe, we're also not the most powerful tribe, are we? And then we lose all of our security. And by the way, the only reason nobody attacks Quraysh, when they travel, nobody attacks them, why not? Because if somebody from Jersey attacked them, they say, oh, I know you from Jersey. You know what I'm gonna do to your God when I get back? Nobody's gonna mess with them because their idols are being held hostage at the Kaaba. There's a political structure in place. In order for them to keep their power, they will not listen to the Messenger of Allah. It's not just that one God doesn't make sense, it's bad for business. It's bad for politics. You understand it? There's deeper problems here. So when the calls of messengers were given, that's, that's why understanding, go to the Pharaoh, he has rebelled. He hasn't just rebelled because he's super arrogant and he thought he was God. He declared himself God for political reasons. He knows himself that he's a withered old man. Quran will say, فَتَوَلَّى بِرُكْنِهِ He turned heel, kneeling on his, uh, on his staff, like the guy couldn't even turn around without a staff. That withered old man, probably leaned over, calls himself God. Can you think about that? Like he can't even stand up straight. And he calls himself God. It's all politics, it's all economics. That's what lies in the root of that kind of psyche. In the common people, it's the religion. The people who control them, it's money and it's power. It's those two things, you know? And that was always there and that will always be there. And by the way, that is a, these cancers, money and power, can affect any religion. They can infect, this cancer can infect Christianity, it can infect Judaism, and it can infect Islam. There can be people that turn Islam into two things, money and power. They can do that too. Our Islam is not immune from that. Quran, its careful study, keeps us, from, keeps us from falling into that cancer, or to recognize that cancer if we already have it. Because the Israelites developed it. For the Israelites, religion became money and power. And Quran called out how it became that and how to cleanse yourself from it. So that's a side note that I wanted to mention to you, especially when it comes to the Pharaoh, these deeper ideas need to be you know, thought about. اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَىٰ and so Allah, Musa alayhi salam says to him, after all the political corruption and the spiritual corruption, at the end of the day, there's a principle in our deen that's so powerful, it's more powerful than any other principle. Only Allah judges. 
Only Allah judges. Ladies, only Allah judges. No, but I know what he's like. No, 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 you don't. No, you can tell somebody's intentions. No, no, you can't, but I can. No, you can't. You don't know what's going on in anybody's heart. You don't know if they're a munafiq. You don't know if they're a hopeless case. You don't know if they're, you don't know anything. But you don't know what they said. Yeah, it doesn't matter what they said. The only one that has the right to judge is who? Allah. Look at what Allah told Musa to say. I'm gonna go to the Pharaoh, Allah, Allah tells you, you go to the Pharaoh. Who is Pharaoh again? Calls himself God, kills babies every other year in the thousands, enslaved an entire people, murderous rampage, narcissistic, the greatest, I mean, shaitan would want his autograph. If you, know, if you go through the Quran, like that guy, like the epitome of a bad human being in the Quran is the Pharaoh. You don't get worse than him. The greatest example of shirk, the greatest example of pride, the greatest example of materialism, the greatest example of attacking a messenger, causing lies, propaganda, you name any crime, this guy's done it. He's, he's the top, top of the top. And yet, what does Musa go to say to him, alayhi salam? What did Allah tell him? When you go talk to him, what should you say? Halaka ila antazaka. Halaka is actually a polite way of doing something. Halaka in Arabic back then and even now is, would you please consider? Like, halaka an ta'tiya bil ma today. Could you bring some water, please? You don't even have to add min fadlik. You don't. Halaka has the politeness in it. Could you please consider that I may call you towards ila? It's not even halaka an tazaka. Because the i'rab would be halaka an tazaka. قال الله عز وجل هل لك إلى أن تزكى. I'm not even saying that you should become a good person. Would you please consider the possibility of heading towards a direction that might eventually make you a better person? Would you possibly consider that for yourself? The ilah is actually saying, I'm not even asking you to tra transform. I'm just asking, could you change your course just a little? Just turn this way and pay attention. Just a little bit. At tazakki bil Arabiya an numu fil baraka wal khair to grow in goodness and to grow in blessings is tazakki. Zakat doesn't just mean purity; it means growth in blessings and growth in goodness. It's like Musa is inviting him. Could I please interest you in you getting more blessings for yourself, having a better life, becoming a better human being? That's how the Pharaoh, baby killer, is spoken to. That's how he's invited. Musa alayhi salam more than anyone else knows how corrupt the Pharaoh is. He lived in his castle. He was supposed to be executed as a baby by Pharaoh's command. He has seen his brethren treated as slaves in that land. He escaped the oppression of the Pharaoh to get out and live in the land of Madian. He knows all too well what the Pharaoh is about. And yet Allah says, despite you knowing who the Fir'aun is, when you go to him, you're going to speak to him softly. Do you see the opposite picture being painted? Judgment day, no mercy. Doors, the gates of punishment opened. The earth shaking. Horrifying scene. And while you're still here, invite them softly. Just, halaka ila antazakka. I might guide you. Could you consider that I might possibly give you some direction towards your master? Maybe. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَىٰ And even you might become someone fearful. You can turn around. You know how people say, it's too late for me, man. I've done way too much messed up stuff. Are you going to be... Are you, you want to compare yourself with the Pharaoh? Pharaoh? You want to compare yourself with Fir'aun seriously? Because you can't beat him. And Allah says, there's a way back for him to Allah. وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَىٰ Allah is, if Allah is all-knowing. Allah knew He's not coming back. But still, and Musa A.S. could have told Allah at the end of all that adventure, Ya Allah, you know He's not going to listen. Why are you getting me to go there, talk to the guy, give him da'wah, this, that? You know He's not going to listen anyway. Our job is not to decide what's going to happen with these people. Our job is to do what Allah told us. Our job is to deliver. And deliver with love. Deliver with sincere care. And Allah Azza wa knew that he always had a choice. Allah didn't force him to go down the dark road. 
Allah actually wanted good for him too. Like he created all human beings. And that's why he gave him the blessing of Musa alayhi salam. Through it, Quraysh are being told, you st what, who stands before you is a messenger from Allah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You are to Quraysh what Musa was to Fir'aun. You are a mercy to them. When they're not listening to you and when they're making fun of you, they don't know who they're messing with. They're going to drown. They're going to drown. An attack is coming. So now we're getting into the second warning. The first warning was judgment day. The second warning is the nation itself shall be destroyed. So now we find how did he respond? What did Allah even give him? فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى Allah didn't just call him to a powerful, beautiful message. He also gave him the greatest miracle. Remember the sequence and this is what we'll conclude with today. Islam, the, the call to Islam is two things. In order. The call to Islam is two things in order. The first call to Islam is for people to have a better life for themselves. To find purity, to find goodness. It's a call to goodness. It's a call to kindness. It's a call to mercy. It's a call to forgiveness. Forgiveness for yourself and forgiveness for your fellow man. Kindness and justice towards others. Taking care of others. Standing up against oppression. That's the first call of Islam. That should appeal to any decent human being. And when that appeals to a human being, and then they say, fine, I see good in Islam, but how do I know? Because I see some good in other religions too. Now that I see good in Islam, there's good in others too. How do I know that this is the right one? Then there's the discussion of alayat al-kubra. Then there's the evidences. Then there's, let me show you why this can only be from Allah. Let me prove it to you. You know what's happened today? We don't call people to goodness. We just want to prove it to them. We want to argue with them. We want to show them how the Qur'an's a miracle by science, or Qur'an's a miracle by language, or Qur'an's a miracle because of the 19 times table, or Qur'an's a miracle for this or that or the other. Then we want to troll them and argue with them and debate with them about the Prophet ﷺ, about this surah, about that or the other. All debate and argument. Did the Prophets come and start with, let me prove it to you? The Prophets come and start with a message of, let me give you a, a, a message that, that is beneficial for you. Inni lakum rasulun ameen. I mean well for you, I come here for your safety. I mean, I, I want goodness for you. That is actually the original message of Islam. Then you show the ayat. Look at the conversation Allah had, Musa had with Fir'aun. When Musa spoke to Fir'aun, he called him to goodness, called him to goodness, called him to goodness. He was about to throw him into jail, then he showed him the miracles. That debate part of the conversation was at the end. Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. We have to internalize that. Islam is not a debate. Don't confuse debate with da'wah. Da'wah is not debate. This is da'wah. Go to, go to the Pharaoh. And by the way, going to the Pharaoh means they're not going to come to the masjid, are they? You got to go to DC. You got to go to the Wall Street. You've got to go to them. Messengers had to go to bad environments. They had to be. Some of you work in bad environments. Some of you have businesses in bad environments. Some of you have universities in bad environments. Congratulations! You're supposed to be there. If you're not going to bring light there, who will? Allah made this ummah carriers of light. Light is only beneficial when there's darkness. <laughs> you're like, I just want to be in an Islamic environment where everything is Islamic and there's no fitna. Well, what's the point of you being in this ummah if you don't want to be around fitna. You were chosen to be in this ummah because you are the only hope humanity has against fitna. You start running from fitna. You start running from tests. What hope does humanity have left? What other messengers are coming? You understand that? We can't run from society. We can't run from it. There's a reason every messenger in history was a minority. Every messenger and their followers were minorities when they came to their people and delivered a message. Prophets are different. Messengers, I'm talking about messengers. They were a minority. Even in Medina, people say, I wish I lived in Medina. It was such an Islamic time. Let me tell you something. The Muslims were a minority in Medina. Population-wise, we were, we were influential, but we were a minority. Medina was a pretty messed up place most of the Prophet's life. Medina had brothels. Medina had bars and pubs. Medina had rampant drinking, prostitution. Medina had these things. Even while the Prophet was there, Ali Sattu 
There were things cleaning up, but slowly. It wasn't what you think it was. It wasn't Medina Sharif yet. It wasn't very Sharif at all. <laughs> you know? And that's the environment in which Allah sent His Messenger, in which Allah sent His book. So we can't, we can't run from it. This is the, this is the, the, the message to Rasulullah and through it, it's a message to all of us. We, the Ummah, are going to be in uncomfortable environments. And that is when we fulfill our purpose as an Ummah. That's what we're there for. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who fulfill the role that we are supposed to as the Ummah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. We'll pick up inshaAllah ta'ala from ayah 21 uh, tomorrow.